praise the Lord. Can you just give the Lord another good hand? I can praise the Lord. I'm so glad to have the children and have everyone back to you. I had a lot of sick. had a lot of folks that are traveling. That's all part of it. Thank the good Lord we are at a place where we can. Amen. Amen. This time last year we couldn't go nowhere, could we? We were pretty much still on lockdown, but God's been good. Yes, he We've is. been preaching. A series called What Jesus Taught. We've been looking at the different lessons that Jesus taught us, the different subjects. But for some reason in my spirit today, I felt led to go in a different direction. I believe somebody really needs this message today. And the title of my message is What We Should Expect. There's three types of people in the world. When you all boil it down, there's only three types of people. There's saved, there's Christian. And then there's those who are dwelling in the secret place with God. And I want to preach to you all that this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn with me to Proverbs 13, verse 21. Proverbs 13, <coughs> verse 21. What can sinners expect? I, we look at the tragedies that are happening all around us. When we look at the school shootings that have happened in Texas, the one in the hospital, in different places, the war in Ukraine. When Russia invaded. Uh, this explains it real simple. Notice what it says in Proverbs 13, 21. Evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. Listen to it again. Evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. Again, I want to preach to you a message entitled, What We should expect. Pray with me, please. Father, we come before you right now in the name of your Son, Jesus, and I thank the Lord that we do a war gathered together in your name. There you are in the midst, and anything we ask you for, you said you do it for us. Lord, I ask you to touch me without a moment to make you preaching effective. Oh, God, give us ears to hear, hearts to receive what your Spirit would say unto the church. Help us, Lord, and not be forgetful here as only to see in ourselves. But help us to be doers of thy word. We pray that your mercy and grace would be with those that are sick in their bodies and healing to them. That your grace would be with those that are on the road. Give them travel mercies. Help with those that are grieving today. And Father, we give you the praise and glory and honor for all that you do. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tell your neighbor, you're glad to see him in God's house today as you are seated. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. When we look at Proverbs 13, 21, it is, a, it is a proverb of rebuke. It is a proverb of exhortation. It should be a proverb that brings fear, and it should be a proverb that brings hope when you read it. First of all, we see the judgment and the fear of Proverbs 13, 21. Evil pursues uh, sinners. The word evil there in the Hebrew is the word ra. It means that which causes misery, that which brings calamity, and that which brings trouble and strife. And you might say, well, you look at a lot of people I know today, Brother Ron, they're wicked as can be, but nothing's going on in their life. No danger's coming. Nothing bad's befallen. But here I am. I'm trying to serve the Lord Jesus, and I've had everything thrown at me but the kitchen sink. But notice what it says here. It doesn't say evil is always with them, does it? It's coming after them. It's on the way. The Bible tells us that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, when we look at this world's calamities and this world's situations, can I tell you, I know there was a lot of people out there protesting guns, but can I tell you, a gun ain't never killed nobody by itself. Somebody had to be pulling the trigger. Somebody had to point and that somebody had to be, unless they were fighting in defense of our country and defending our freedoms or protecting us as law enforcement uh, officers or defending somebody's life, that was somebody that had sin in their life, in their heart. And that was somebody that needed Jesus to deliver them. We don't need more gun laws in the United States. We need revival. Amen. Go ahead and give God praise on that. We need revival. We don't need people teaching more acceptance. We need people preaching and teaching the deliverance. Hallelujah. And God bringing people out of sin and wickedness and transforming them to be what God has called them to be. Evil pursues sinners. Who is the sinner? The sinner is the one that has broken the word and commandment of God. And doing those things that are not pleasing to God. 
We don't like to hear that word in the church anymore. Don't call me a sinner. You can call me whatever you want to, but don't call me a, trend, a sinner. Don't call me a wicked individual. Well, beloved, guess what? If you're breaking the law of God, you're a sinner. Amen. But I've got good news for you. You can quit breaking it. You can find forgiveness of your sins. You can come out of that iniquity. You don't have to be that way for a lifetime. So there's the judgment. And there is the fear that wicked sinners, that evil people should expect. They should expect judgment. But what about the righteous? What should the righteous son expect? Notice what the Lord says here. Inspiring the psalmist to write. The proverb is right. But to the righteous, good shall be repaid. And again, maybe you're here today and you're doing everything you can to serve the Lord. But it just seems like nothing's working for you. And you're wondering, where are you at, God? What's going on? It's coming. It's on the way. Let me remind, remind you of what the psalmist said. If you will turn with me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. To the 23rd Psalm. We know it well. <clears throat> Look at what happens when the Lord is your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I may go through seasons of it. But it's not always going to be my lot in life. Notice what it says in verse 2. We're going to go through all of this, Brother Glenn. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. That means that there's going to come a place in your life where God's going to provide for you. God's going to bring you seasons of peace in your life. He restoreth my soul. He will renew you. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He will cause you to live right. You might be battling with a sin <laughs> or a habit this morning. God will give you victory over it. Verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, a lot of people say of Christians that we hide our head in the sand and we pretend uh, that nothing's going on. David said, oh no, even though I walk through the midst of the valley, even though death comes into my family, even though my nation might be in bad shape and trouble, even though we're going through troublesome trials, I, I don't have to fear. Why? Because God is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. I want to remind you this morning that God is on your side. God is fighting for you. Hallelujah. The Bible says I've never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seed begging bread. Hallelujah. The Bible says that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them from them all. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, understand this isn't the end of the story. <coughs> Hallelujah. God is with you. Look with me at verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Who does? God does. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. There we see again God's provision for us and the anointing in our life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. What's coming after me? Goodness and mercy. That which is beneficial, that which helps me, and the kindness and the favor of God is coming after me. Remember, I told you that evil is pursuing sinners. Wickedness is pursuing sinners. Hallelujah. Sooner or later, they're going to have a payday. But goodness and mercy is coming after the child of God, after the child of God. Sometimes, hallelujah, I think that if we could just slow down and stop and enjoy the presence of God, sometimes we might just let goodness and mercy catch us. But we're going so hard and we're going so strong and we're running so fast and we're not praying we're not seeking God's guidance and direction. God just said, man, I really want to bless them, but they just want to invite me into the problem. Boy, I'd really like to heal them. I'd really like to move in that family situation. But they can't stop and ask me what to do, so I can't bless them. I can't help them. And so we're trying so hard to solve the problem by ourselves, we're missing the blessing and favor of God. So you need to slow down and ask yourself this question. Am I doing what God wants me to do? Am I being what God wants me to be? There's going to be a lot of Christians who miss it. We say it all the time here. There's going to be people you thought were in heaven that didn't make it. There's going to be people you didn't think were there were going to be there. And the same for the other place too. Let me share with you some of what I'm talking about here. Matthew 7 
22 and 23. You know, there's a lot of people who've been hurt by Christians. Amen. Come on. There's a lot of people, they've said something to them, they might have been jesting, they've been things that have been done to them, and they were wrong. I saw something the other, the other week where a pastor did something to a child, I couldn't even go into the description of it, it made me sick on my stomach. You ought to be able to come to church and find a place of refuge, a place of healing, a place of acceptance, a, a place of protection. But I want you to realize, not everybody that's in the house of God is saved. Not everybody that claims to be a child of God is a claim of a child of God. <coughs> Notice what Jesus said here in Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, talking about the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, notice what they said here. They called him Lord. They thought they were saved. They thought that Jesus was, was their Lord and Savior. Have we not prophesied in your name? Sound like good Pentecostal folks. They said, we feel like we were led by the Holy Spirit. In your name, cast out demons. And in your name, the many wonderful works. In the name of Jesus, these were good Pentecostal folks. They thought they were right. And notice what Jesus says to them in verse 23 of Matthew 7. And then I will declare unto them, I never knew you. What terrible words to hear from the Lord of glory. I never knew you. Lord, I worked for you. Lord, I did marvelous works. Lord, I spoke in tongues. Lord, I Ran the pews. Lord, I gave my money to be burned to, to orphans and widows. I've done all these things. The most important thing you can do, beloved, is know that you know Jesus Christ. I'm reminded many times of the seven sons of Sceva and how they would go out and they were, they were exorcists and they would cast out devils and they would say, we command you to come out of him in the name of Jesus Christ. Who Paul preached and it would work for them, but they ran up on one man one day. How many of you know sometimes you can pretend to be saved, but sooner or later the devil's got your number. And he will show you where your walk with God is at. One day these seven sons of Sceva ran up on this old demon-possessed man, and the devil inside of him rose up. And he said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And he beat them all naked, and beat seven. One beat seven, and set up the fly. They were running out into the street, naked and bruised and wounded. I want to tell you something, beloved. You better do more than know about the name of Jesus. You better know him. You better understand him. You better walk with him and talk with him. Hallelujah. This is what can be expected for the person who's playing Christian. This is what the individual who comes to church but never is truly born again can expect to hear the Lord say, Depart from me, you work of iniquity. Brother Tim preached a message not too long ago, going to hell with heaven on your mind. What a terrible thing to think that you're ready for heaven and miss it. Amen. The Bible says do everything. Everybody say everything. everything. Everything to make your calling and your election sure. Are you doing everything? Hallelujah. Have you checked the Word of God to make sure you're living according to it? Have you done what the Bible says? And this is what troubles me. There's a lot of preachers who will tell you, oh, you don't have to do that. All you got to do is believe. But the Bible says, Mark 16, 16, Whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Whosoever believeth not shall be condemned. John 3, 36, I've been telling it to you for the past few Sundays. Uh, whosoever believeth the Son and his teachings hath everlasting life. Whosoever does not believe them, the wrath of God abideth on him. You've got to believe what the book says about Jesus, but you've got to believe what the Word says and tells you to do. It's not optional. Go ahead and give God praise. That's all right. So we see that evil is pursuing the wicked. And while they might be having a heyday right now, they might be living large and enjoying life, one day wickedness is going to come. We see that the child of God can expect our provision and the blessings of God to be with them, for God to protect them, for God to keep them. But I want to share with you some other things that the child of God can, per, can expect. Look with me at Mark 16, 17 and 18. Maybe you would say to me, well, is that all there is? That ain't bad, but is there more to it? Oh, yes, there's more to it. Notice what it says, Mark 16, beginning with verse 17. If you can pull up verse 17 for me there. Notice what it says here. And these signs shall follow those who 
believe, hallelujah, in my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Let's park right there for just a minute. Go back with me to that verse for just a minute, brother. Notice what it says here. These signs, notice what it says, that does not make you saved. It is a sign of you being saved. You've done what the Bible says. You believe you've been baptized uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus. These signs will follow. It is a result of believing. In my name, they will cast out demons. Hallelujah. How many of you know you got authority over the devil? Amen. Hallelujah. A lot of us don't act like it. He'll get on us on Monday and rob us all week long. And then we come to church hoping for a little bit of relief when we've got the authority inside of us. Hallelujah. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Jesus Christ is in you right now. If you're a child of God, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you have authority over the devil. If it's a devil that's bigger than you, Jesus gave you something to do in regards to that. He spoke oh, glory to God. He said, where two or more of you agree, whatever they ask for, I'll do it for them. Hallelujah. We can bind on earth. It'll be bound in heaven. We can loose on earth. And it'll be loosed in heaven. Beloved, we got to start believing the word of God and practicing it. Now, notice what it says here. In my name, they will cast out demons. Uh, they will speak with new tongues. We believe in being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. We believe that the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and as we surrender to him, we can speak with other tongues as he gives the utterance. Now let's go to verse 18. Uh, Mark 16. They will take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. Now we see what this is like example in the Bible when Paul was shipwrecked and he went to build a fire. He didn't go looking for a snake. But when the snake came after him and it bit him and it was supposed to kill him, he shook it off into the flames. It said of John the Revelator, before he was sentenced to the Isle of Patmos, they tried to poison him. Guess what? The poison had no effect. Because God wasn't done with him. He had to give it him, oh hallelujah, the revelation yet. I want to tell you something. You're not going nowhere until God's ready for you. Go ahead and give him praise. You want to know why COVID has not taken you out? God has through with you. You want to know why cancer and heart disease and everything else has taken so many others has not taken you out? God's not done for you. He's got a work for you to do. Oh, hallelujah. And you need to be living for him. And notice what it says here. It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I want to tell you what COVID has been. COVID has been an attack on the church because what the enemy has tried to do is isolate us and the enemy's tried to get us to where we doubt God's word. Because we prayed and prayed and prayed and the healing didn't manifest. We prayed and prayed and prayed and, and we didn't see it. But I want to tell you in just a little while why I think that happens. Uh, we, can be, we can be saved and still be sick. I mean, we can be saved and still go through stuff. But we know that God is with you. I just shared with you Psalm 23. But look with me at John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. Notice what the word of God says here. In John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now notice this. Everybody's not a son of God. But those who receive. Everybody say receive. receive. you got to receive Jesus. You ain't automatically saved. you got to receive Jesus. At some point in your life, you've got to pray and ask God to come into your heart. you got to acknowledge you're a sinner. you got to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You receive Jesus Christ. He comes in but notice what happens here. Maybe you're somebody here and you're frustrated because your walk with God. You know your walk with God isn't where it needs to be. Notice what it says here. He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. The King James says that he gave them the power or the ability. It doesn't mean you automatically arrive. How many of you know we can we got all these lights in here and it's bright right now, but I can flip those two switches and it'll be dark. Like that. In the same way, we can have all the potential in the world, 
to light this room up. But if we don't flip the switch, we're going to be in darkness. In the same way as a child of God, you've got to flip the switch. And the way you pass from darkness to light, the way you get born again, the way you start on that journey, Romans 10, 9, and 10, you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You repent of your sins and you let Jesus be Lord of your life. Hallelujah. Somebody gives them praise, praise of the Lord. What can we expect as children of God? We've already looked at the wicked can only expect judgment. The wicked, even the Christians, pretending to be, be children of God, they don't can expect children, expect judgment. But for the child of God who's lived right, the child of God who's walked in right, we can expect God's provision. We can expect God's leading. We can expect God's anointing. We can expect God to give us power over the enemy. And we can expect to see healing in our lives. Look with me at John 16, 33. This ought to make you shout a little bit. Maybe not. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me, everybody say in me, in me. ye might have peace. See, that's what's wrong with a lot of people in the church world today. You remember last week I told you that Jesus said that we can go in and out. Once we get saved, we go to different places in our walk with God. And if you're not careful, God will even let you walk away from you. He'll never walk away from you, but he'll let you walk away from him. And that's where a lot of people are at. They said, God let me down. God failed me. God let, no, God never left you. You left him. Not one of his promises have failed. You got outside of Christ. Notice what he says here. These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. That word peace means a inner, inner wholeness, inner unity, inner joy. It doesn't mean that everything around you is peaceful, but even in the midst of the storm, you can have peace because you know who your Redeemer is and you are persuaded that you're going to see him. Face to face. Notice what it says here. In the world you shall have tribulation. See, there you go. There's the shouting point. Jesus, Jesus never said you wouldn't have trouble. He said, as a matter of fact, you're going to go through tribulation. Not the great tribulation, but you're going to have troubles and trials. But, hallelujah, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You might be in here this morning and you might be facing some of what Jesus prophesied to you. You're going through tribulation. You're going through physical tribulation, emotional, family problems, financial problems. But I want to remind you today that Jesus overcame everything the devil threw at him. Hallelujah. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding for you and me. And one day soon the Father's going to say, Son, go get your child. Go get your bride. And I believe that the trump of God is going to sound. And those that are dead in Christ are going to get up out of the ground or wherever it might be that their physical bodies are. And they're going to meet the Lord in the air. And then those of us which are alive and remain, we're going to be called up to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be hallelujah with the Lord and there will be an end to our trouble and strife. There will be an end to the pain and suffering we're going through as children of God. But the wicked is going their suffering is going to go on and on forever. What else can we look at? I want to talk to you for a minute. I'll talk to you about the general Christian. I'll talk to you about the sinner. But I want to start focusing on this secret place. Something led me here not too long ago because I find in my prayer life different seasons. Maybe you find this too. There are times I pray for this church, everybody in this church, every day. I believe God will bless you. I believe God will touch your family. Then there are times I really get deep involved in intercessory. I start getting individuals, calling individuals out as the Lord calls, lays them on my heart. And I pray for different ministries. But I want to talk to you about another place of prayer. I disagree with an individual. I saw somebody on Christian on Christian on uh, Christian TV the other day. They they had a prayer shawl. They put the share prayer shawl. Oh, that's the secret place. Remember, there's something different when you pray and you're in this place I'm about to tell you about. And I believe it's a place that's accessible to every child of God. But a lot of times we miss it because we either intercede and we're rejoicing 
or we're not doing anything at all. And that's what it says in Psalm 91, verses 1 to 16. What can I expect? I love the way David starts the song. He that dwelleth. Do you dwell in prayer? Brother Tim brought it out this morning in Sunday school excellently. There used to be a time when the church got prayed, and I mean, they had business with God. They would come hours before service and stay till hours after service, and they would pray, and they would ask God to move. Cody kind of put a damper on that. We were doing really good there at Earl for a while. We need to get back to praying at the hour and seeking the Lord. But he that dwelleth in the secret place, that means that when you go home, you're in the secret place. When you go to work, you're in the secret place. When you're in church, you're in the secret place. It's a place where you are abiding. Notice what it says here. In the secret place of the Most High. And you get the imagery, if you will, of the temple. How many of you know that when you look at the design of the temple, there was the outer court where the Gentiles and the women could go. Then there was the inner court where the men could go and they could present their offering. But then there was the holy place and then there was the most holy place. Do you know who could go into the most holy place? Only the high priest once a year. And not without the shedding of blood to cover the sins of the people. I want you to realize and I want you to understand that represents our lives. A lot of times when we're lost, we're in that outer court. We're not saved. We're not close to God. When we get saved, we have a portion of his presence. We have, we have the fullness and potential of the spirit within us, but we haven't surrendered to him. We move on in into the inner court. Then we move on into the holy place and we get more of God and more of God. Then we move into the most holy place. Hallelujah. And there we abide. I don't know about you, but I, I love it when, when John, or excuse me, when Zacchaeus saw a visit from Gabriel and he told him that he was going to have the son, and they called the name of John. Do you remember what the Bible says? He tarried long in offering the sacrifice. And the people wondered what in the world was going on. And because he didn't believe Gabriel's words, he was mute when he finally did come out. That's how I want to be. When I get into God's presence, I don't want to leave. We have services like that from time to time. We have services where God's presence comes in and flows among us in a mighty way, but we just don't want to go. Why? We're in that holy place. Don't you want that when you go to work on Monday? Don't you want that going with your children to school? Don't you want that when you go on vacation? Don't you want that? Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. We're going to the beach, Lord willing. We're going to leave out Tuesday. I want the holy place with me. I want to be in God when I go to the beach. When I go to General Assembly, I want God with me. Camp meetings coming up. We need God with me. That's what it says here. He that dwelleth, abideth, liveth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of of the Almighty. You're not in the fullness of Because how many of you know on our best day, we just catch a glimpse of God. Our best service can't equal all the wonders we're going to see. Notice what verse 2 says. There's 16 verses here. I'm going to try to get through, but look at what it says. This is the difference between the normal Christian and the, and the one who's abiding in the secret place. How many of you know the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And the Bible says that the tongue sitteth on the course of our life. Now notice what we've got to say to start getting into the secret place. I will say of the Lord, I will say of Jesus, he is my refuge and my fortress. Brother Tim, hit on it today. We can't say that any politician is our refuge or fortress. We can't say that any law is our refuge or fortress. We can't say that any, oh hallelujah, any economic state of our nation is our fortress of refuge. We've got to declare and stand on and live on the fact that the Lord is my refuge. Can somebody declare that by praise and offering today? We give him the Lord. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. Now, I want you to realize as children of God, why do we need to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart God raised him from the dead? That's where you start saying it. When they come to you and the doctors give you a bad report, you need to say, I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. When they come to you and they say that you've got a bill due, the Lord is my refuge and my fortress. Uh, what is my refuge? What does that mean? I got to study that out in, in the Hebrew, and it's interesting because the word refuge there means a place of protection when slander is coming against you. 
Are you living your life in such a way that the, church, that the world is going to come against you and maybe even people in your own family and the church come against you? Hallelujah. Notice what it says here. He is my refuge. The devil is saying, you are sick in your body. The Lord says, no, I'm healed. Who are you going to believe? My refuge. Notice what it says. My fortress. The fortress is a place where you go when the enemy is raining down on you and he's, he's thundering and pouring storms on you. you got to say, you got to declare, hallelujah, when you get bad news, uh, when troubles and trials come, you got to say, the Lord is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. What are you trusting in? Notice what it says here. This is something else you got to declare. Surely he shall, everybody say he shall, yeah. deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise of pestilence. Hold right there for just a minute, brother. Notice what it says first of all. It doesn't say that the troubles won't ever come into your life, does it? It just says God will bring you through it. Notice what it says here. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare and the fowler. When the enemy tries to trip me up, the Lord's got my deliverance. When the enemy tries to make me sick, the Lord's got my deliverance. Look at verse 4. Sometimes the deliverance only comes when you get the glory. But you're on the winning side. You're going to make it. Notice what it says here. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long have I desired to gather ye under my under my wing as a hen does gather her chicks, but ye would not. There's a lot of people that are telling God, leave me alone, God. I want to be saved. God want to make it to heaven. But I don't want the, the what I got to sacrifice. I don't want to give it up in order to be close to you. And so God lets them go their way. And God lets them struggle. And God lets them go through it. Wanting to deliver them. Wanting to work. It's the same way for us today, but he wants to defend you. Notice what it says here, verse 5, as we move along quickly. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by noonday. Hallelujah. That's saying that troubles are going to come and trials are going to come, but you don't need to be afraid of them. Look at verse 6. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Beloved, I'm going to tell you something. It's not on this side of glory that we're going to see everything, but on that side. I love what Job said. I'm about at the end of Job with my Bible reading. And Job said, Yea, though he slay me. Yet will I trust him. Now I want to tell you something this morning, beloved. What you got in this world is not the end of this story. You got something better. Notice this. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy, everybody say this with me, habitation. Not a place you visit on Sunday morning, on Sunday night or Wednesday night, but a place where you live, a place where you dwell. A place where you abide. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Notice what it goes on and says. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Verse 11, 12. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. How many of you remember that was the exact same scripture that Satan quoted to Jesus? But Jesus said, Thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to the test. Notice this. It goes on and says, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon, shalt thou trample under feet. Now notice what it goes on. Verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me. Now notice what we've got to do in order to walk in victory. we got to abide in Jesus every day, 24 7. We've got to make him our habitation. Notice what it says here. We've got to love him. Therefore will I, and here it is again, deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. How many of you know you can't be deliver, delivered unless you're going through something? We don't hide our 
head in the sand as children of God. We trust the Lord. Notice what it says here. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be, here we go, with him in trouble. He says he's going to keep us from trouble when we're about it. Then he says if the trouble comes, he'll be with us in it. So either or it can happen when you abide. But the key thing is, you're going to come out on the winning side. Notice what it says here. I will deliver him and honor him. Hallelujah. How many of you would like to see God honor you? Amen. You know what's going to happen on the, on the day when we stand before the Lord, when we say, here I am, Lord. We're going to receive a crown. Perry Stone called it the Burma Factor. It's actually like Napoleon had a bandana with a whole bunch of tro uh, trophies and signals on it. I hope mine's covered about two or three times. He's going to give us these crowns of gold and these crowns. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to take those little crowns off because we know we're not worth it. And we're going to lay it down at his feet. Because he alone is worthy. Why? Because he was dwelling with us. We were in the secret place. We kept praying. We kept believing. We kept holding on. Now listen to this. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So what can we depend on from God whenever we're dwelling in the secret place? God's protection. God's presence. God's deliverance. Even when the storm comes on us. What does the sinner have to look forward to? I'm going to ask the praise team to come back to the instruments and get ready to lead us to the throne room of grace. What does the sinner have to look forward to? One day, there's going to be a payday. They might be living large now, but they will answer for their wickedness. Evil and judgment is what the sinner can expect. The Christian can expect authority over the devil, manifestation of the Holy Ghost, and a power to be like Jesus. But, if you're willing to commit to a different level of prayer, if you're willing to commit to a different level of service, you can expect to be in a place where God is walking in special favor with you. You can expect it. Psalm 9 1 teaches it. And that was before Jesus came. So, how much more does it apply to us now? How much more can we expect to see the judgment of God on the wicked now, since we're under grace? I'm going to ask every head to bow, every eye closed. Praise the King. Thank you, Mr. McDonald.
confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Maybe you're here today and you're that second type of individual I talked about. Maybe you're a Christian, you believe, but you're just not as close as you once were. You're not walking with the Lord. Maybe doubt and the troubles and cares of life, the difficulties of life have caused you to question God's word, to question his son. What you need to do is renew your faith in him today. Same thing. Say, Lord, forgive me of doubting you. Come into my heart, be Lord of my life, afresh and anew. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Maybe you're here today. You would say to me, Brother Ron, I'm a Christian. I'm walking right, but I hear what you preach. I want to move to that deeper place with God where I'm abiding in his presence 24-7 where I'm at a strong prayer life, where he's operating in me and flowing in me. Hallelujah. I feel the witness of the Holy Ghost. If that's you, I just want to tell you what you need to do to say it again. Oh, please forgive me for being content with where I'm at. Stir me, Lord God. Move in me. Move me deeper in you. Hallelujah. Maybe you're here today and you're in one of those three categories. If you're lost, I want to challenge you to call on the Lord. He'll save you right where you're at. If you're a Christian and you're backslid, or maybe you're complacent in your walk with God, and you're wondering where the power went, where the anointing went, where the joy of the Lord is, it's going to be found in you coming back to the Lord. And you're renewing your prayer life. You're renewing your worship. And for those of you who want to go to that secret place, you need to pray, Lord, take me there. Teach me to abide in your presence. Teach me to abide in the Holy Ghost. To live in the Holy Spirit. And as the praise team gets ready to sing again, won't you spend some time with God? These altars are open if you want to come down to the altar. You can make an altar where you're at. We'll come and help you pray. If you need salvation, won't you come and give your heart and life to Jesus? If you need to come back home, come back home. That's God to give you. Maybe you're a Christian and you're doing all you can, but you just want something more. You, you want to get to that secret place where you're abiding with God. Won't you pray and say, Lord, help me to dwell in the secret place. Help me to abide under your shadow. I love you, Lord. Help me to do it. Hallelujah. Father, we give you the praise and glory and honor for all that you've done, for the lives that you've touched and what's going to happen. 
from this moment forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If this has been a blessing to you, can you give God praise and glory? Amen. Don't forget the service this evening at 5 o'clock. If the Lord will, willing, we're going to continue our series looking at what Jesus taught. Don't forget all the announcements. we got a baptismal service coming up the last Sunday of the month at Brother Tim and Sister Tina's house. we got two on the list right now. Um, Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, Whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but whosoever believeth not shall be condemned. We believe in that. We want to do what Jesus tells us to do. Amen. We also I want to let, remind you we got camp meeting coming up. There's been a change in the schedule. Uh, to the Monday night speaker um, has changed. Brother Tim Hill, our general overseer, is going to be there uh, Monday night. Um, it would be wonderful for you to be there if you can. It would be a blessing to you. Be in prayer for General Assembly as that's coming up. And remember all those that are sick, Brother Tommy, Brother Buddy, Brother Johnny, Sister Francis, all those that are under the weather, those traveling. My hearts and minds are clear. Brother Brian, if you would, would you stand and dismiss us with a word of prayer?